Hello and welcome to our daily vlog at Kimmel Bay Church. Today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 9. And uh, I've got a question for you to begin. Uh, is there someone you've been praying for for a long time? It might be a close relative, a friend, and maybe you've asked God to reach out to them in a miraculous way. But up to now, it hasn't happened. Well, today, we're going to look at an occasion where God did reach out to someone in an amazing way. And as a consequence, how his life helped to change the world. We're actually going to look at Paul's conversion. Now, we first come across Paul, or Saul, as he was called at the time, when he was looking after the coats of men who were stoning Stephen to death. And next, he began to destroy the church, going from house to house, dragging people off to prison. Then he asked the high priest for permission to go to Damascus to arrest the Christians there as well. So off he went. Now as he neared Damascus, there was a flash of light. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? he asked. I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So Saul got up off the ground and he was led to the city and for three days he didn't eat or drink. It gave him time to think about what he'd done to Stephen, about the Christians he'd arrested and also the damage that he may have done to God and to God's plans. In Damascus there was a believer called Ananias and God spoke to Ananias another miraculous event and he said go to Straight Street and see a man called Saul. So Ananias off he went. He placed his hands upon Saul and he said brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and he was baptised. We learn that he immediately went to the synagogues and started preaching that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And then, of course, he went to meet the disciples in Jerusalem. So what sort of guy was he? We know he was a man of action. No doubt about that. Uh, why, could, why did God pick him? Well, the answer is very clear. Uh, in verse 15, the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. So this man of action, his background, well, he was from Tarsus, which is now part of Turkey. He was from a Jewish family from the tribe of Benjamin. But because he was born in Tarsus, he was also a Roman citizen, which gave him special rights. He was a tent maker by profession. But as an er at an early age, he went to Jerusalem to a Bible school where he studied under a rabbi called Gamaliel. He was a Pharisee who rigidly followed Jewish law and traditions. He was very multi multicultural as well. He could speak Latin and Greek, which was ideal for him to witness to the Gentiles. What about his character? That's important too. But he had great knowledge of the scriptures and of Jewish history. He was able to debate and give reasoned arguments and impress even the most learned people. He was intelligent, quick thinking, skills that helped him sidestep some real problems later on. He had, had integrity. He wasn't self-seeking. He was a zealot, a zealot for Jewish traditions with an honest desire to serve God. He was loving. We can pick that up from the way he looked after the churches that he helped to establish. And it's very clear in his letters too. But he was humble as well, well aware of his weaknesses. He often talked about a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it was, maybe a physical illness that caused him pain, or maybe opposition, or maybe the temptation to be proud or arrogant. 
He was tenacious. He wouldn't give up. Uh, Philippians 4 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He was selfless, willing to place his hands into his life into God's hands. All the more determined because of the damage he'd caused. He was brave too and resilient. He'd faced a lot of situations. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 11, he said, Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times shipwrecked. Constantly on the move. In great danger from rivers. From bandits. All sorts of great difficulties. He was a pretty brave guy. Paul needed a nudge to follow God. A big nudge. And that's what happened on the road to Damascus. All his beliefs shattered in that flash of light. This one encounter changed him, sent him in a new direction, using all his talents to serve God. So what were his achievements? Well, they were immense. He wrote nearly half the books of the New Testament, 13 out of 27. He completed three long missionary journeys over 32 years, preaching throughout the world, setting up churches wherever he went, even went to Rome. And in the end, he said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So God chose Paul because he was needed to spread the word to the Gentiles. He also chose other people too, Abraham to be the father of the Jewish nation, Moses to lead the people out of Egypt, Mary to be with to be the mother of Jesus, and of course many others too. And of course he's chosen each one of us. But back to our original question, why doesn't God appear miraculously to convert everyone? Surely if he appeared in a blinding flash, everyone would follow him. Not necessarily. Consider the Israelites. Moses led them out of Egypt and they saw the plagues. They saw the Red Sea parting. They were fed with manna and quails. They saw water coming out of a rock. They saw a pillar of fire leading them along, but still they moaned and rebelled. It was only the next generation who entered the promised land. Uh, a more up-to-date little story. Uh, a close relative of mine once had an encounter with God. She woke to find a very bright light in her bedroom and Jesus standing in her room, pointing at her, as if to say, you need to follow me. She could still even see him when she put her head under the pillows. Yet today, she's still a long way away from Jesus. You see, God doesn't want us to be like robots, blindly following him. He wants us to choose to follow him. He wants us to have free will. Unfortunately, many choose their own path instead. Jesus told his disciples the parable of the sower to explain this. He said a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it. You see, some hear the message but don't understand it and the evil one comes along and snatches it away. Jesus said some fell on rocky places but where there was, wasn't very much soil. The seed sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants withered because they had no roots. Someone hears the word, they might then receive it with great joy, but quickly fall away as soon as troubles or difficulties come along. And Jesus said, other seed fell among the thorns, which choked the plants. This is someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the desire to gather wealth choke the word making it unfruitful. Still other seed fell on good soil. This is where someone hears, understands, and their lives are fruitful. So there are many reasons why people ignore God. Maybe because they're so hard of heart and so set in their ways, they won't change. But through Jesus, everyone has the opportunity to seek him and find him and commit their lives to him. For those that don't, we can still encourage them and pray for them. 
Paul in Romans 11 verse 33 says, How great are God's riches, how deep is his wisdom and knowledge. Who can explain his decisions? Who can understand his ways? Who knows the mind of the Lord? Who is able to give him advice? For all things were created by him, and all things exist through him and for him. So the answer's simple, really. God is sovereign, and we must trust him. Maybe we can finish with a prayer. Let us pray. O Sovereign Lord, we thank you for your love and presence with us. There are so many things we don't yet understand. We bring before you today all those loved ones who don't yet know you. And we pray that in your mercy you will reach out to them. We pray for ourselves too, that we will become more faithful, more determined, more humble and more loving as we live our lives to serve you. Amen. So there we are. Thanks for listening, everyone. Goodbye now. Take care.